This is a <clears throat> personal reflection on a man that shaped my life into what I do today as far as being a pastor and <clears throat> a counselor and a writer. Dr. J. <clears throat> J. Adams was born on January 30th, 1929, and recently was promoted on November 14th, 2020. I just found out about this from a good friend in Canada, and this was confirmed by a couple in Indiana who heard about it. Uh, in our neck of the woods of Pennsylvania, um, I don't know whether they even know who Dr. J. Adams is, frankly. Dr. J. Adams is a prolific Christian personality, more than a personality. He was a profound uh, man of God who sought to place before the mind of his hearers the mind of God. That was a driving motivation in Jay's life, to place the mind of God, the word of God, in front of the mind of the person who is listening to him, reading his material, even being counseling, uh, counseled from him. I first came across Jay Adams at Moody Bible Institute in a pastoral counseling class. I can remember Dr. Wayne Hopkins deriding, ridiculing, mocking, Dr. Adams' approach, back then it was known as confrontational counseling. I can remember Dr. Hopkins saying that a pastor was out of his realm to go ahead and tell anybody anything was sin. Here I am having sold a business in Florida with 22 employees moving back to my hometown of Chicago, attending a college that I respected back then. And I'm being told as a pastoral candidate, you can't confront sin. That's up to the Holy Spirit to do that. And I'm out of my realm if I do that. Uh, that was disappointing. It was later confirmed, however, with my oldest daughter who went to Moody and experienced the same <clears throat> ridicule and treatment of Dr. Adams. Even when she approached the professor to invite somebody in who had more knowledge of this thing called nuthetic counseling, uh, he refused to do so. So my first exposure to Dr. Adams was not a positive situation. So as I got into ministry, I found myself counseling quite a bit, and I believe that is because of the efforts being blessed by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the Word of God and tell people there are answers and there are hopes. What drew my attention to this thing called nuthetic counseling was the same people were coming back with the same problems. And I would come up with something new to try to trigger a permanent biblical response to their situations. But alas, what I had to offer was humanistic psychological approach to problem solving. Back then, <clears throat> these little plastic bags would come in the mail with, oh, 40 or 50 different organizations that would advertise and promote material that you could purchase. And I would thumb through them because I was kind of into graphic arts, arts back then. I guess I still toy around with it a little bit. 
and I saw a four by six card about biblical counseling from the Institute for Biblical Counseling by Jay Adams. <clears throat> and I looked at that and I thought, Jay Adams, huh? Flashback, Moody Bible Institute. I threw the baby out with the bath water. But yet there was something inside of me that says, you know, Thomas, you're you're missing something here. <clears throat> and I had his three books, the three foundational books that were recommended to read. And so I dug them out, dusted them off of the pastoral bookshelf, if you please. And I started reading. And I could not put them down. I read. And I read. And I couldn't put his writings down. Because God was communicating to me a most important principle. I was not taught and I had not discovered. I would gather data. I would try to do my best to gather data. And then I would jump to a solution. I would jump to the solution. Meanwhile, I was missing a very important element. And God used Dr. Adams to bring that to my attention. And when I started practicing, understanding what he was trying to communicate and giving me examples from his own life and ministry, I began to see changes in people. Some were not good. They didn't want to hear the truth, and so they left. Others persevered. Persevered. I can think of one young man right now who is a manager of a construction company down in Arizona. So as I began to immerse myself into this thing called nuthetic counseling, which is a Greek word, by the way, in the Bible that you can find, often translated exhort or admonish. As I began to embrace the nuthetic counseling approach, and as I read Dr. Adams' personal life experiences, as he was preparing in seminary for counseling, he would go to the local um, behavioral center. Back then it was the mental institutes. And he would go in there and he would volunteer. And he came across people who were in there because um, they were guilty. Uh, they did not use their parents' money wisely in college, and they were addicted to things. And so this was their way of escape and a host of other things. And he began to sow the seeds of the word of God about repentance and about regeneration and about hope. And the year that he volunteered, they had the highest release rate in the history of that institution. Now, is that because Jay was so clever and so articulate? Was, was he an Apollo? Apollo? Uh, no. He was a man of God who believed in the power who believed in the power of the word of God to set people free. So here I am in my first pastorate. And my wife and I decided to go to North Carolina to his little church, little Presbyterian church. He was a dyed in the wool reformed Presbyterian. <clears throat> we had some minor theological issues relating to eschatology. 
But we went to this little church and there couldn't have been any more than maybe a eh, hundred of us who had gathered for a weekend conference. And Jay was a prankster. He wasn't overly emotional. I, I really never saw Jay tear up, let alone weep or cry or sob. But he was a he was a jokester. And I remember that weekend, he had all of these pastors come up to the platform that were wearing ties. You know, these straight lace pastors back then. The only version is the King James, and you can't come to church unless you got a skirt and a tie on. And he, he called some up. And he had, <laughs> he had a pair of scissors. <laughs> and he cut their ties. It's <laughs> all. And he said, you guys need to loosen up. <laughs> and Jay preached his heart out. And my very first NANC conference, National Association of Nuthetic Counselors, NANC, he challenged us and reminded us that the pioneers of this movement were growing old and they wouldn't always be around, <clears throat> you know, kind of like Moses and Joshua and the elders. And he simply gave a challenge. He didn't give an invitation. He didn't say all of you who want to join the movement. No, he just said, hey, look, which one of you are going to Which one of you are going to fill the shoes after some of us are gone? And I took my wife's hand and she grasped mine. We didn't have to we didn't have to say a word between us. We knew the level of commitment that we wanted to enter into. So we came back and we began to see God work. We went to Colorado for about a year and then came back. And while being a adjunct professor at Moody Bible Institute, I decided to get certified. And that was a pretty rigorous process that you had to go through. <clears throat> there were certain books that you had to read. There were case studies that you had to do. You had to do 50 hours of supervised counseling under what they called a fellow. This was someone who reached the top of the food chain, if you please. And so I decided to do that. I wrote my exams and the person who supervised my hours was Dr. Bob Smith. I don't know whether he is alive today or not. I suspect that Probably he has been promoted to glory as well. And he was extremely helpful. And so we started Mount Carmel Ministries. I was teaching in the evening school at Moody Bible Institute when we started this. I found it interesting over the six years that I taught there, I usually, and I'm not bragging here, I usually had the largest classes that were being offered. And one of the reasons I believe directly attributed to the hunger and thirst of those people who came was that the word of God was being passionately presented with relativity, with practical application. These minority people, all of my classes as a rule, were 
African American and Hispanic. They worked 45, 50, sometimes 60 hours. They would come dragging into class. But they would leave energized knowing how they could apply the Word of God to their Sunday school class, to their deacon ministry, to whatever it was. And because I saw what was going on at Moody and I was hearing from these dear folks what was happening in the local church, I was reading the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And you know the demonstration of God's power. And the thing that stuck in my mind was the words that he gave to the children of Israel before the demonstration of spiritual power. He says, how long will you halt, will you hesitate between two opinions? If Baal is God, serve him. If God is God, serve him. And at that point, spiritual light went on in my head and said, that's it. That's what I'm going to base this counseling ministry on. And so we began to develop the ministry. I left Moody Bible Institute and I started Mount Carmel Ministry. We started a counseling center, just myself. It later expanded to three other part-time counselors and a full-time uh, secretary, receptionist, administrative person. We were able to expand the little office that was donated to the ministry in this Baptist church to an entire wing of the church that the youth were non-existent in, able to convert those rooms into private counseling offices. We began writing material, counseling material, and wound up developing five counseling tracks and uh, with tests and everything else. Eventually, I went to correspondence, which was not real successful, but a lot of people could not come or did not want us to come out to where they were. Eventually, the ministry did develop, and at one time when I was in Chicago, we were out, I think, four nights a week in four different churches, uh, which took a toll, which took a toll. We began traveling to other churches across America and even overseas, presenting biblical counseling or neuthetic counseling. Before this thing ramped up, <clears throat> I met with two of the leading men at NANC, Randy Patton and Bob Smith, and I brought a sample of one of the notebooks down, and each track consisted of uh, 30 hours, one night a week, three hours a night. So five tracks, the person would get 150 hours of neuthetic counseling training. Uh, they laughed at me. They said, this will never take off. People are not going to sit there that long for 14 months. It's just not going to happen. Well, God proved them wrong. And when we decided to relocate to Montana because we had a thriving ministry in particular in the African-American community. When we decided to relocate to Montana, we dissolved the Chicago land-based ministry. And I was reprimanded by the man who certified me, both as a regular member and as a fellow, I had reached fellow status, which means now that I can supervise those people that I trained. I was mocked and ridiculed and even chastised. The, the man told me, why didn't you consult with us? You, you can't do this without consulting with us. And I was an independent, if you please, counseling center. We were under the umbrella of NENC, but I did not know that I had 
I was supposed to have such strong ties that I cannot make a decision without their approval. I believe, and I still believe it today, that they were upset because they had no inroads into this minority community. In fact, a sister counseling center up north really didn't know how to interact with the African-American community. And so we re relocated. We did a one week, three hour night at a Grace Bible Church in Bozeman, Montana. And then once a month on a weekend, we went up to Cut Bank, Montana. When I came back to the last conference, Jay Adams was now sitting down preaching. And this was his last time that he would be at a conference, I think because of several circumstances. But he issued the same challenge. Now, I had been involved, Carolyn and I had been involved with NANC for quite a number of years. And it still resonated with me. That night, Jay retired, big fanfare. But behind the fanfare, there was a subtlety that was taking place that I believe Jay could not embrace. And it was the changing of the Nank direction and philosophy to what is known now today with uh, the organization. Jay retired to Carolina. He continued to write, did some conference work. Although I only spoke with him twice, maybe, in all the years that I have known him, if you please, virtually, I do remember one time walking down the hallway at a conference, and he looked at me and says, Pastor Rick, how are you doing today? And I thought to myself, how in the world do you know who I am? And it was a uh, moment that was precious and that I retain and cherish. We've lost a tremendous servant of God. He lived out well beyond three score and 10 and 10 more by the grace of God. A prolific writer of over 100 books translated in 16 different languages, including the translation of the New Testament prolific writer, author, conference speaker, touched so many young pastoral lives with great wisdom, love and tenderness as only Jay could give because he was not an emotional person. There is Now a second void in my heart. My dear bride, who is now probably sitting down <laughs> and asking, asking Jay a whole bunch of questions about why I do, do the things that I do. And then of course, Jay. He will not be forgotten in my life. His memory will not be dismantled. His influence will not dim. In some small way, I hope to continue to carry the torch that he gave or that he offered to so many and to the small amount of us who said, I'll carry the torch. Thank you, Lord, for 
placing this man at that time in my life. Jay, you were loved and you are loved.